Hi, and welcome to a new episode of the Energetics of Happy Relationships podcast with your host, Juliana Joy. And I feel so excited to record this episode today with a health expert. And you may think, why is a health expert being a guest on the Relationships podcast? Well, I do think there is a massive correlation between our health and our relationships. And the topic today is going to be all about emotional eating, binge eating, eating disorders, and other unhealthy habits that are caused or made bigger through our relationship challenges. And maybe vice versa, that when we have eating disorders, this can have an impact on our relationships as well. So I want to introduce Matty Lanston, who is based in Australia, and he is the host of one of the most successful health podcasts called How to Not Get Sick and Die. And Matty, I'll just want to invite you to introduce yourself with your own word. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Juliana. Excited. Thank you so much for the invitation. Matty, you are hosting this very, very successful podcast for a few years now. And this thing has grown massively over the years. And so far, I know you have also primarily female audience. Mm -hmm. And somehow in that time, you specialize in eating disorders and in emotional eating. And because I was um, a guest on your podcast, what I could learn in the course of this little project is that so many of the women had those reflections like, oh, I have a topic with anxiety. Oh, I have a topic in my relationships. And the purpose today, I will be asking you about how can we bring a better awareness of what are we actually doing when we have a psychological, emotional topic in our relationships how are we practicing those unhealthy habits but before we dive into that i would really love to know how did you started doing all of that because you're a scientist aren't you i am yeah so i guess it was a very unique journey as i guess probably a lot of people that are on podcasts have very interesting journeys but i think where i'm at now is definitely not where i started so as you said i started as a scientist and I was working, I had a few different jobs before I sort of settled into the main part of my career. I sort of worked in nutritional epigenetics. So I worked with elite athletes on sort of understanding the genetic profile of their metabolism so that the organization I worked for would create personalized nutrition for performance. And then from there, I moved into working in a cancer hospital as part of a cancer research team. So I did that for six and a bit years and learnt so much but that was the main experience that I had working in that hospital that led me to ask different questions because it was interesting to me that in all of the meetings conferences and lectures that I went to no one was ever talking about the cause of disease everyone was just talking about different drugs and how to keep the person alive for as long as possible but nobody talked about how do we reverse the disease how do we prevent the disease and so this was confusing to me. In that process, I learned that obesity and being overweight is the number one predictor of cancer, diabetes, Alzheimer's, dementia, Parkinson's, all of the diseases that modern civilization has manifested over the last 70 to 100 years. And so I thought, well, how do people become obese? Food. So I became a nutritionist. And on that journey of working with people on weight loss and gut health and nutrition and sort of diseases as well, where food as medicine was the strategy, a lot of people really struggled to change their behavior with sugar or fast food or Coca-Cola, whatever it might be. And so I thought, oh, I'm giving them the information, but they're not changing. Why are they not changing? Or they would change for a little bit, maybe a week or a month, and then they'd go straight back to what they were doing before. Or even in a cancer context, People would heal their cancer and go back to the diet that caused cancer or the lifestyle that caused the cancer. And so that then led me to ask why. Why, despite knowing all of this information, do people still do these things? And so that's where I do my work now, whereas I then studied to become uh, an emotional eating and binge eating disorder coach and specialist in this area of eating disorders. And that's where I work with people and helping them to answer the question, why don't I do what's good for me when I already know what to do? This is amazing. I love it. And you know, when I start working with women, they have this very high level of awareness. They come to me and they're like, Juliana, I have an anxious attachment style. I know it. I know it. And I can't help it. <laughs> so, 
And this is really where this deeper level of work is needed just to have those long lasting shifts. And I just love what you say in the journey and how you developed into the root cause of the things. Yeah. And can you define what is emotional eating? What is an emotional eating disorder? And then what's binge eating? That's a good question because those three things are quite different. So emotional eating, a lot of people in the beginning don't identify or connect with that label. And so emotional eating is basically eating for any other reason than biological requirement. Like you as an animal, as a human, need food to energize the system, put energy into the, the motor of your body. And if you're not putting it in for that reason, then essentially there's another reason. Why am I putting it in? Cravings or sugar, dopamine chasing pleasure type behavior. And so you might be going towards food for lots of reasons. You might have been stressed and you're like, when I get home and I get on the couch, I'm going to eat ice cream because it's been a really hard day. And then the question is, is that because my human body needs fuel? No, it's an emotion where we're eating for stress. Or it might be maybe you've been through a divorce or a breakup and you want chocolate. You want to feel good again because you're so sad and it's so hard. The only thing that's picking your emotions up is eating food that triggers dopamine, the pleasure hormone, the happy hormone, right? And so it's any other reason than your body needing energy to operate is usually emotional eating. And when we talk about binge eating, that binge eating and emotional eating can very easily fall into the same space. It's usually that I'm eating for a reason, again, that's not nutritional requirement. And a binge then goes usually into the space of eating until you feel unwell, until you put so much in that you feel sick, that you feel really brain foggy. And that was my experience with sugar. Sort of earlier in my life, I used sugar to sort of numb my emotions so that my blood sugar was so high, I couldn't really think straight. And so I used to do that every time anger or depression or frustration or any of these negative emotions, which are all normal emotions, but they're sort of on the heavier side. I used sugar to suppress that. So again, that's emotional eating. And I used to justify it by saying, I'm a young man that goes to the gym and plays sport. I just need the energy. But the truth is I did not need that kind of energy. That was very damaging to my gut health, to my blood sugar, to my brain fog and insulin resistance. And it did not feel good at the time, but it felt better than feeling the emotions that I was avoiding. And so binging is eating, emotionally eating to the point of not feeling physically well. And then an eating disorder, it kind of gets a bit gray here and you get a lot of people that disagree because at what point does it become an eating disorder is usually based on the frequency of how often you indulge in that behavior or indulge in sugar or indulge in chocolate or wine or cheese to the point of feeling unwell. And then we have other eating disorders, of course, bulimia, which is where you usually eat something that you wish you didn't and then you vomit it up. That's common anorexia, which is when people are starving themselves often because they feel that they are much bigger than they are. So they've got a misrepresentation of the way they see themselves versus reality. And that's getting more medical. But if we're talking binge eating disorder and emotional eating, that's sort of in one category. But usually emotional and binge eating also inform bulimia and anorexia. They're all kind of connected. So it's a very gray area to sort of say, this is one, this is the other, this is the third one because they're all connected. You know what? When you speak, I can feel it because this resonates with me. Yeah, wow. <laughs> it made me emotional. But I, I just want to share. I had in the last 12 months, two clients who came to me after discovering and working through their binge eating mm. issue. And the one, it was really interesting because she was married 15 years. And in the last two years, she said, I was binge watching TV shows mm -hmm. and I was binge eating. To a point where she put on weight. And when she came to me, her husband asked for divorce, had already a new woman in his life and so on, which was really challenging. Let's of just course. call it challenging. And what is interesting is for two years, she has been practicing binge watching TV and binge eating. Yeah. She's somewhere like after one and a half year, because of the weight gain, she started doing something about it. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards, the divorce situation came. And yes, they reconnected later on and everything is great. But my point here is, if this woman would have noticed the reason why she suddenly started doing that behavior from being a healthy person, and if she would have started to work on the both symptom, which is the eating, and on the root cause, which is the relationship situation, like a year earlier, even half a year earlier, she would not have gone through this major life crisis 
yeah. or family crisis they have been through. Because for me, especially with talking now about families and relationships, when you're married, you've made a vow. It's such a strong level of commitment that it's also very easy to be reversed mm -hmm. if you do not let that thing blow up. Yeah. For me, and why I'm sharing this is I see women come rather late mm -hmm. and rather late see the actual issue, which is either I'm not able to build a strong relationship or my relationship is not okay. But the signs of my soul is not happy before, and they often showing those unhealthy behaviors that you are talking about. Yeah. So from that perspective, how can we help our audience understand if they have an issue, if they have a topic with binge eating, emotional eating, what are the, the warning signs? Yeah, that's a really good question. And, uh, and I like that you describe that clients come towards you often when they're very deep into the problem or it's maybe even too late to save the relationship because it's very similar for people that have challenges with food. By the time people are willing to do the emotional side of food, the, the normal diet world has been failing them on average for 25 to 30 years. They've gained weight, they've lost weight, they've gained weight, they've lost weight. And that is a perfect sign. That's like the number one sign that you are possibly an emotional eater because you were never able to stick to any of the diets. Some of them would have been good. Some of them would have been great. Some of them probably were bad nutrition advice. If you've done lots of them, but there would have been one or two in there that were probably pretty good. And you weren't able to stick to them because it shouldn't be about sticking to something. If you've got to stick to something and force yourself and use lots of willpower and it's hard, nobody wants to do hard. Sure, hard happens to us from time to time, but our day-to-day -day life, we have to eat every day. And if two to three times a day, it's hard and it's difficult, nobody wants to do that so often all of the time. So what's happening there is even if you've got healthy, delicious food and you've had healthy, delicious food before, and the question is, well, why can't I keep doing this? My answer is usually, well, there's some kind of emotional need that is driving that behavior. It's also important to say it's not just always emotions. Sometimes you're actually not eating the right food, which is driving sugar cravings because you're not nutritionally getting everything into your body that you need. And our body goes looking for sugar because it's a really easy source of fuel to access. The problem is if we're driving ourselves towards sugar two, three, four, five times a day, we're slowly destroying the body because anything in a bag, a box or a can is most likely toxic on some level to the body or unhealthy, which is not me saying you can't have it sometimes, but it's the frequency. If we're doing it a couple of times a day or multiple times a week, then it's damaging the body. If we're doing it once a week or once a month, then the body's totally fine to look after itself and take care of it. But I think one of the big signs is, have I tried lots of diets over the years and am I still in the same situation? And do I have an attachment to food in the sense that I'm always eating chocolate or I can't control the amount of ice cream that I eat? As soon as I have one scoop, then I have all of them. And there's a bit of a saying in this space of emotional eating or sugar addiction, and it's that one bite is never enough and the whole container is too much, right? And so you can't do either for many people. It, and some people need to totally say no forever because it's like an addictive behavior, like alcohol or like wine and, and like drugs, that type of thing. Other people can learn to put different boundaries in place. But if you know yourself well enough to say, I know I've got 30 years of experience or 50 years of experience in my life, that whenever I have one chocolate, I have the whole block. Like it happens every time. We know that about you now, we've got to work with that. But over time, we can learn to regulate our relationship with those foods, but it's not through willpower. It's through that lens of understanding why I'm desperate for dopamine. Why am I seeking pleasure at the bottom of a bag of lollies or a sweets or candy or chocolate or whatever it might be. So I think if anybody's gone back and forth on any type of nutritional strategy before, it's highly likely that there are some emotions that need work behind that. And I have a question. I've seen so many women who are so disciplined and mm -hmm. they say, I have to be super healthy. And I sometimes would like to challenge this excessive discipline. If you would take it away, mm -hmm. would that same person drift into a very unhealthy behavior? Because for me, when you deal with your emotional issues, the root cause, which yeah. 
in the context of relationships that often called anxiety, taking actions based on anxiety. When you deal with that, you can deal with it with this excessive discipline, almost become like emotional soldier. Yeah. Or you can go into soothing yourself through dopamine, through emotional eating. Have you seen women shift from this highly disciplined position into completely the, the total opposite? Well, the thing that I teach is that we don't want to be yo-yoing. So if we're going from extremes, of highly disciplined, then we don't want to abandon all discipline because then we're going to create the opposite problem, right? And so we might have the same problem just in a different way. But I would say, because people often describe themselves, I'm an all in or all out person, right? I fully commit or I don't. And I actually challenge everybody that says that because if you were really all in, you would never need to speak to me because you would have gone all in the first time and needed nothing else for the rest of your life. And I had this conversation with a client this week that she said, I really love structure. Structure keeps me accountable. It's really, really helpful. So I said, why didn't the structure before now work? And she was like, oh yeah, good point. <laughs> because if structure really did keep her accountable, again, she wouldn't need me. She's had structure many times in many diets with many practitioners. And so I think as well, we can use that as a bit of a self-sabotage mechanism to say people like to speak about the identities that they wish they could inhabit, right? I wish structure helped me is really what people are saying at that moment. I wish I was actually an all-in or all-out person because to admit that I'm not is a failing and I'm embarrassed about the fact that I'm not strong enough to be able to do these things and it's shameful, right? And so... For me, when somebody shows up with extreme discipline or that kind of attitude towards discipline, I challenge them first and foremost and say, I don't think you are that person. And the next thing is, it's okay that you're not that person. And we need to also look at what, what do you feel safe about in saying that? If discipline and structure makes you feel safe, where else in your life can we build in structure in a way that feels like you haven't been forgotten about, it, things aren't going to go terribly but allows us to reduce the level of structure around your food. Because there's something rebellious going on here that when you do have structure, it doesn't last. Because there's a part of you that's either not getting the nutrition that it needs, or there's a part of your mind or soul that is rebelling against the structure and saying, don't put rules on me. I don't need rules. Like you're controlling me. And, and I can relate to that personally. I know myself well enough to know that when somebody else is enforcing strict structure on me, and it's probably why my podcast does well, I rebel. I have a different opinion. I find ways to break the system. And we all have a part of ourselves that is rebellious, right? Because rebellion is sometimes about self-protection. And so if we feel the structure is maybe like our parent when we were younger or the husband that we divorced that was really controlling. And so we might actually see the diet or the nutritional template as that imposing force that's forcing things onto us, controlling us, limiting us. So we rebel by having the ice cream, having the chocolate, having the wine, having the cheese and say, no, I can do whatever I want. I'm in control. I don't need this structure. And then tomorrow we wake up and say, oh my God, I, I did it again. I did it again. He just described two different personalities. The I want to be in control personality, which is like structure and the personality, which is I'm rebellion. And this is my way, right? And the first personality in my new quiz that I just launched is called the natural leader. Mm -hmm. These are women who want to have a grip on their life and everything else included, their eating, their fitness, their wellness, and so on. And thank you so much for expanding on that question. I asked it specifically because I often see women who are not comfortable noticing the yucky emotions they have. Mm -hmm. And there's the one group of us that go into soothing behavior like eating. And there's the other group that goes into this structure control. So this is another way to not feel the yuck. And for me, this rebellion picture that you just described actually is also a way to not feel the yuck, <laughs> if you're really honest. And I recently had in a coaching session, a really interesting experience. And I have to say the request that I go for coaching is, how do I work deeper on my deserviness and worthiness? Mm -hmm. So it has nothing to do with eating. Yeah. So this is my kind of overall request that I am getting help on. Yeah. And in one of the sessions, I was so shocked. Mm -hmm. I could see myself as an early teenager, 10, 12 plus minus, sitting in the kitchen, eating sandwiches 
with those beautiful, white, soft, nice bread and feeling lost. Mm. And this was shocking for me because I'm on the self-development journey for a decade now. I have done tons of hypnotherapy, regression, coach, all of that. And I have never, ever been able to access this insight. That's amazing. I could really feel myself, this young teenager, sitting there eating and just feeling that insane, soothing feeling of I'm well, I'm safe, I feel lost. Yeah, wow. So as a result, my whole life, you know what I'm doing? When I want to celebrate something, I eat something sweet. Mm -hmm. When I am not feeling good, I go and open the fridge. Yeah. And if you think of when do we need love is when you celebrate, when you achieve something, you want to share with people and just have that feeling of love. Yeah. Or a scientist would say dopamine, right? Yeah. Um, and the second time is when things are not going well, then you need love, right? And support and, and all of that. So sad it was <laughs> in my early years, my support system was the fridge. Yeah. It's very sad. And I, I get sad now even speaking about that. But by the fact that I was able to realize that gave me a massive opportunity to work on it. Yeah. And I have, through similar experience like that, I've developed in my program a heal your inner child energetic approach. Yeah, and that's nice. very funny yeah. because most women, they go to therapy. Pretty much everyone has been for a while. And what you do in therapy is you work with your inner child. Like It's almost like a prescription for everyone. Yeah. But when you start breaking the timeline and going energetically back to that moment and healing the moment, you kind of make those shifts. The shift otherwise before would prevent me from stop eating chocolates and sweets and all those kind of sugar stuff. Yeah. And ever since, when I eat, I eat for pleasure, not for emotional kind of satisfaction, whatever it is. And this is kind of the, the way to raise the awareness, just because so many of us, they're doing something. They're not exactly aware of why are they doing it? Like, why am I in control? Why am I a rebellion? Why do I open the fridge when I'm feeling bad and when my husband is not at home late in the evening and I don't know where he is and I go to the fridge instead of asking, like, what's going on, right? So this yeah. is kind of the behavior. Well, I think all of those behaviors are fundamentally escaping myself. Like that they all fall under that same thing. Because if you've got enough nutrition in your body and you've got nothing else that is required of your body, like maybe you need to exercise or whatever, say that you feel great, you've done all the right things today, your body feels good. If you want to do something to escape the moment or ex escape your experience, then you'll watch YouTube, you watch Netflix, you'll eat food, you'll do anything. And so I think universally, all of the things that you just said come down to escaping the experience of being me. And when you want to escape what's going on between your ears, like all of the thoughts and all of the feelings in your body, that's one of the big reasons why it's not even necessarily I'm eating to create an emotion. Sometimes it's I'm eating to distract myself from my emotion or from my inner experience. And I think that's really common as well. We're in such a busy world. There's so much going on. There's like our phone and social media goes off on our phone like 50 times a day at least. And all of it is just an escape from being present. And being present in my own body for many people is uncomfortable because we've done it so little, especially with technology these days. And so we're not familiar with what goes on in our body. And none of us really were taught by our parents about how to be in our own emotional body and what that means. And that's because they didn't have the skills at the time either. And so be it food, be it YouTube, be it porn for people, be it maybe picking a fight with a partner, whatever. It's like we're all escaping how it feels to be me. Thank you for sharing that. This was so amazing. That's okay. So if I understand correct, the way you approach the topic is on the two levels. The one level is the pure knowing and the fact. And then the second is really going into that root cause of like what make me have those unhealthy habits. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, that combination that sort of psychology meets nutrition and nutrition meets psychology. And I think that they both kind of feed each other because the food we put into our gut programs, our microbiome, the bacteria that live in our gut, and they communicate with our brain through the gut brain connection. And the way that we think and feel impacts the hormones that get released in our gut. So it's a two-way conversation all of the time. Oh, <laughs> wow. I'm sure in your 400 plus podcast episodes, you have a few which expand on that topic. I'm pretty sure. 
Yes, many. So we maybe just put a link to those selection of those episodes you have in the show notes. Yeah. For everyone who wants to, to have a deeper dive on the topic. Sounds great. Happy to. Because for me, probably the main goal for this episode here is just to raise awareness about what we are actually doing. Yeah. And not every one of us will resonate. However, I'm happy to challenge that as well, because if you think of coffee, if you think of smoking, if you think of drinking and eating on top of that, I just want to question how many people are not doing any, yes. at least one of those. <laughs> so it's, it's, the portion is not very big. <laughs> yeah, no, I completely agree. And, and you often see people when they're talking about their vice, that's the, the English phrase is, oh, everybody's got a vice. Right. And and like you said, it's coffee for some people, it's food for other people, it's chocolate, maybe it's cheese, maybe it's wine, maybe it's cigarettes, maybe it's drugs or or even prescription medication is used in this kind of way as well. So, yeah, it's hard to find someone that doesn't have a vice that they need to work on. So from that perspective, if everyone got triggered, please come to my Instagram in the DM and let me know. But I hope this is going to serve a higher purpose. Getting triggered is good. Mm. (laughs) Getting triggered is a chance. So this is what you're here for, to help and to raise awareness and get you triggered, get you solved and and help you on the way. Because my self-development journey started, a friend of mine invited me to the German psychologist Hellinger, is in in German, in in English, probably Hellinger pronounced. Mm -hmm. So he's doing those settings where you see what other people are thinking of you and you understand your relationships. So a friend of mine invited me to an event like this. And I was, end of my 20s, I was super successful in my career and I had nothing to do on the weekend. Yeah. And so I went there. They asked, like, why? And everyone said, I want a new job. I want to improve my relationship with my mom and things like that. And I was sitting there, totally arrogant. And I go, well, I'm super happy. I'm here just for fun. (laughs) And they were like, okay. And what I did not say out loud was, if only my boyfriend of six years would commit. (laughs) Gotcha. (laughs) And I went out of that. It was a full day workshop. I was so shocked because I didn't even assume Mm -hmm. what are the things that I was supposed to work on. So... Even if somebody starts a quiz with, oh, I'm fine, I'm doing this just for fun, or I'm listening just for fun, I'm sure that there will be some takeaways and it may need some time to simmer in the mind. We sometimes need to sit on the ideas, but I'm I'm sure this is really, really helpful. Thank you so much for joining and taking the time to do that. okay. Thank you for the invitation. It's lovely to catch up with you and chat about these things that I spend all of my waking hours doing, basically. (laughs) (laughs) And in the show notes, we'll link your podcast, a selection of relevant episodes for everyone who wants to have a deeper dive. Amazing. Okay. Bye-bye for now. Bye.